welcome back everybody. Another exciting video in the Blue Glow Electronics uh, series of videos. This one, if you'll notice down here at the bottom, I've um, decided to do an entire series on audio tube amplifiers, kind of a uh, 101 classroom style. And it'll probably be 20 or 25 videos in this series, and I'll intermingle these videos with the traditional types of videos you've been seeing from me. Um, if you'll notice, this is video number two. Um, the last time I did video number one, which was really just a primer, um, it was the syllabus and it was a little bit to see if people were interested in this or not. And I thank everybody for their feedback. Sounds like they are. And I um, thought I might try to uh, take incorporate some of the feedback I got and move a little bit away from the uh, traditional what you might call uh, PowerPoint mode and uh, get a little more interactive going on here. So what we've done since we last um, met was um, I've picked up some software called Camtasia software. Uh, it's really great software for making and editing videos as well as doing what they call um, screencasting, which is what we're doing right now. Um, I've also uh, leveraging a piece of software called SmoothDraw. I've picked up a Wacom Intuos um, digital little uh, drawing board here you can see. And I've ordered a Blue Yeti microphone, which will hopefully help with some of the sound quality around here. Um, it's not here yet. The other three pieces I'm uh, up and going with. So let's uh, let's move on into the next part. Um, as you can see, this is EE Math 101, aka Pragmatic Math for Technicians. All right. In the spirit of keeping it real and in in line with our Audio Tube Amplifier 101 series. This is a Western Electric 142 amplifier schematic, just a basically a good old classic 6L6 push-pull amplifier with some uh, 6SN7s on the front end. But none of that needs to make any sense to you right now. Um, if I told you that I was going to walk you through this schematic from left to right and tell you the purpose of every single little line and component that you see in here, if I told you I was going to teach you how to figure out what each one of these values on these components mean and why they are what they are, and how this amplifier works from one end to the other, that probably gets you excited. Um, I can tell you I'm not going to do that in today's class, but what I am going to do across this entire series of 25 videos or so is get you to a point that hopefully you can do that. But what I do plan to teach you today is the basic EE, which stands for electrical engineering, math required to figure out what any of these components in this thing would be. Um, you know, the voltages, the currents, the resistance in this amplifier, uh, maybe some figures around power. I'm going to teach you the math required to basically understand, diagnose, test, rebuild, or even design an amplifier like this. Um, so if you can get the four or five basic concepts that I teach you today and you can be comfortable with them, um, you can do any math you need to do as a, as a technician. Um, now, if on down the road you want to become an engineer, um, you're going to have a lot more math to go through because I'll explain as we go along this maybe a little bit of the difference between what I would call technician math and engineering math um, as we get into it. Let's dive on in. Bear with me here. I'm new at this tablet and I'm learning it, but um, thought I'd show you the difference here maybe with the analogy of um, difference between engineering math and maybe uh, uh, technician math, if that makes sense. Um, so let's pretend that you fish for a living, okay? And um, the tides affected your job greatly. Um, you needed to know when the tides come in and when they go out and how long they're going to last and how strong they're going to be and some of those types of things, okay? Um, you could take two different approaches to that. You could take the engineering approach, which is you would have to understand the earth, its gravitational pull, its um, how it, its axis isn't exactly centered, um, how the moon gravitates around the Earth. Um, you would need to know a lot of things and how the, how the moon's um, gravity affects our water tables, um, which ultimately affects the tides. 
and this would take you about three years of science at least and you could then finally calculate um, when the tides are coming in and how strong and how long they're going to last or whatnot. Or you could be a technician fisherman and you could go to the local little store, pull up the newspaper, or go online, and you could look at a uh, tide table, which is a chart. Um, and if you're okay with looking at a chart and saying, hey, it's 6 a.m., and the tide's coming in at this time, and it's going out at this time, and it'll be back in at uh, 7 o'clock p.m. tonight, and go back out, and this is high tide and low tide, and etc. If you're okay with this approach, then you're going to be great with um, what I'm going to teach you. Um, this is what you learn when you go to four years of electrical engineering school. But then when you come out and you start working on equipment and you're doing things like replacing uh, output transistors or maybe recapping units or heck maybe you're even designing a small little amplifier or whatnot you can do it with this so hold tight and uh, we'll keep going all right let's learn a basic concept here called exponents um, they're really simple uh, and they look scary but uh you may have remembered doing something like this in school but uh when you have two with a little smaller two up top, sometimes known as the um, exponent, this one would be also maybe called two to the power of two or two with two with an exponent here of two. But the answer, the way you get to that is you say two times two equals, and two times two equals four. It's the same as if you had two to the third power, it would be two times two times two, right equals what eight because you would say oops you would say two times two is equal to four times two equals to eight let's do one more here with two to the fourth two times two times two times two equals two times two is four two times eight is six i'm sorry two times two is four times two is eight times two is equal to 16. If you can get that basic concept, let's do a little different one here. 3 to the second power equals what? 3 times 3 equals 9. And then let's work with the base 10 here. So 10 to the second equals to what? 10 times 10 equals to 100. Let's do one here. 10 to the fifth. Whoa, that's a big one. Well, it's no harder. 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, right? And if we do that here, 10 times 10 is 100, times 10 is 1,000, times 10 is 10,000, times 10 is equal to 100,000. Okay, let's do a few more here to get comfortable. 10 to the fourth. One with four zeros, right? 10,000. Let's do 10 to the fifth. One with five zeros. Five. Come back. 100,000. 10 to the seventh. One with seven zeros. Five, six, seven. If we come back and put our commas every three, 10 million. 10 to the third equals to what? One with three zeros equals 1,000. If you've got that, um, move it along well. All right, let's try a new concept here. 10 to the second times 10 to the third. Well, it's just a rule of exponents you have to learn and remember, but you can uh, multiply exponents on a base of 10 by adding these numbers. So 10 to the second times 10 to the third is equal to 10 to the fifth because we said two plus three here equals five and if you'll remember you can write that with one five zeros right one hundred thousand let's do another one here um, ten to the fourth times ten to the sixth equals ten to the tenth it was four plus six equals ten here okay let's do one or two more here um, 10 to the 6th, ooh, let's do something different here, divided by 10 to the 3rd. Well, 
When you multiply, you add the exponents. When you divide, you subtract. So 6 minus 3 equals to 10 to the third. So 10 to the sixth divided by 10 to the third equals 10 to the third. Let's do one more here. 10 to the fourth divided by 10 to the second equals to 4 minus 2 equals to 10 squared. All right? Um, you may also see this written a little bit differently. You may see it written like this um, with the divide over top. 10 to the 4th over 10 to the 2nd, and you simply know that you subtract those two, and you end up with 10 to the 2nd, if that makes sense. Let's do one little tougher one over here in the corner, maybe. 10 to the 2nd times 10 to the minus 4th. Well, the same rule applies. You add them when you're multiplying, so you're going to say 2 plus minus 4 is the same as 2 minus 4, so the answer to this will be 2 to the minus second. Ooh, we've not learned how to write 2 to the minus second yet. Let's learn how to do that. Okay, let's learn how to write um, base 10 negative exponents. So 10, we just learned what, minus 2? You do this um, by writing down two zeros, and then you put your 1. But you always have to have a leading 0 here. So the answer is really... 0.01. Let's just get used to this a little bit. Um, so 10 to the minus third, you'll write down three zeros and then your one and you'll come back here and put your decimal point. So 10 to the minus third looks like this. Let's do one more here. 10 to the minus fifth. Of course, you write down five zeros, put your one then, come back, put your decimal. It's really not tough stuff here. Um, 10 to the minus fourth, one, two, three, four, put your decimal here, your one here, you are good to go. Uh, let's do one here, 10 to the sixth times 10 to the minus tenth equals to what? Remember we're going to subtract, I mean we're going to add these exponents, right? But when you're adding a negative number you're really subtracting it. So it comes out to be 10, which is 6 minus 10 equals to what? 10 to the minus fourth. Let's write down four zeros. Let's put our one. Let's come back and put our decimal. That's how we solve that problem. Okay, let's make it really simple now. Um, I'm going to show you how to use a calculator to do all this because uh, as a technician doing technician math, you don't have to sit around with a uh, pen and paper. You can uh, use a calculator. So um, first thing you want to do is go to any calculator, the one on your phone, the one on uh, your Mac, the one on your Windows PC, whatnot. You want to go to view and you're going to want to change it into scientific mode. Pretty much all these have this mode. Um, and there's a key on here and, and it looks like an X with a Y um, above it here, basically an exponent symbol. And you can use this key to solve problems. So let me show you how to do this. This first one here is what, uh, 10 to the 27th. Um, if you'll come back over here and look, you can say 10 and then push this button, X to the Y. Type in 27, hit the equal sign, and you end up with a 10 or a 1 with 27 zeros after it. And I'm not going to write that down over here, but, but you get the gist of it. Let's solve the next one. 10 to the 13th. But if you'll notice, it's a negative 13. So you have to hit the 13 here, and then you have to hit this plus minus, which denotes the uh, minus 13 here. And then you get if you'll count them, there are 13 zeros here. We put the 1, we come back, and we put the uh, decimal after the first zero, you know, just like we did on paper. This next one here, let's see if we can solve this one. So we've got 10 to the 3rd times 10 to the 4th. Well, if you'll remember, 10 to the 3rd times 10 to the 4th is equal to 10 to the 7th, because we add the exponents. 10, um, little sign, 7 equals. 10 with, that's a 1 with 7 zeros after it. Let's do this 10 to the minus 6. 10 xy 6 hit the minus sign equals 2. If you'll notice there are 6 zeros here and 1. So it's doing it for you. Um, similarly if you want to solve something like 4 to the 8th um, that's equal to 65,536 um, 3 to the 4th power equals 2 
81. And if you'll notice, there's another button here that'll automatically do cubes for you. So like 2 to the third power, it'll automatically do that. Or like one here, 3, and um, this x squared, so 3 squared equals 9. Um, but primarily use this little button here. Um, let's do one more. 2 to the fifth power equals to 32. Really simple to use your calculator to do everything we've been doing today. Okay, I've made a little chart here. Hopefully it's going to help out with a few things. Let's uh, see what we've got going here. Let's try something here like 10 to the third is equal to what? One with three zeros after it, right? So let's come over here and put a one with three zeros and kind of align with this chart here where the decimal's at. You could also write then, that then as if you see here, you're in the K range equals to one K, and that's with a capital K. Um, if you're wondering why there's no de denotation over top of this, these are just regular digits like ones, tens, hundreds, then you get into the uh, thousands where you start using the denotation K, millions, and giga for billions over here. Rarely do you see the G used in electronics. As you go to the uh, right of the decimal, in other words, uh, less than zero per se, or less than one, I'm sorry, um, you really get into the first ones here are milli, here you see. This is a uh, symbol for the word micro. This is an N that stands for nano. P for pico. Um, and this was milli, M-I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. Uh, kilo, K-I-L-O. M for mega, G for giga. Okay, so let's do a few more examples here. Um, let's say one zero 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 zero, right? So what six zeros? One two three four five six. You put a one here, you end up with what one? You can see up in here one mega whatever we're talking about. I will give you an example though. Typically when you're working this side you're either dealing in uh, resistance which is measured in ohms. We'll learn more about this later. Or maybe in Henry's which when we're dealing with um, inductance. But we're not going to learn about that right now. Um, let's try one on the other side. Let's say we have 0 .001 right? 0 .001 equals to what? One little m, one milli, equals to one milli. And in this case, if we're dealing with capacitance, they're typically measured in farads. That's how you measure capacitance, which is equal to a little f. So you put a little f here, one millifarad. So if you had a capacitor of 0 0.001, right, in size, it would be the same as saying, you know, if that was a farad, it would be the same as saying one millifarad. Um, let's go with a 10 microfarad. Well, how would we go figure out what that looks like? Well, since we know that would be 10 of these, right, microfarads, we would have a zero here, a zero, a zero, a zero point. You really discard any zeros to the right of the one there, so you end up with point zero 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 one is so if you had that number, it would be the same as ten microfarads. Let's do a few more examples here. So if you had a number that was right here, you would simply know that is one hundred nanofarads. Put your one, two, three point see why sometimes <laughs> you wouldn't really want that size of capacitor and you couldn't write that on the size of a little bitty component maybe about that big in size you couldn't put all those letters on there but a little bitty component this size you probably could get a 100 nanofarad written onto the side of that little bitty component so that's why we use these abbreviations it gets even worse down here if you had a one picofarad device, you know, that's pretty small. You could write that on the device. But um, if, you, if you had to do picofarad, one, two, three, one, two, one, that would be how you would write out one picofarad. If 
you'll notice here we're also dealing with, uh, could write that uh, 10 to the minus 12, but we've kind of moved on beyond that at this point, and we're starting to use some practical stuff here. Okay, let's talk a little bit of real world scenario here. Let's say you're working on something and you look up in a schematic and the uh, parts list and it says you need a 4700 nanofarad um, capacitor. And you go online and you search on websites and you can't find any 4700 nanofarad capacitors. So you realize that a 4700 nano capacitor, right? would actually be written um, like this, right? With the de decimal in front of it. But what would that be the same as, right? It would be the same as a 4.7 microfarad instead of a 4700 nanofarad. You basically just move the decimal to the left three places. So 4.7 microfarad capacitor, right, is the same as a 4700 nanofarad um, because we come 1, 2, 3, and then it becomes 4.7 nanofarad or microfarad. This device you may be able to find online and actually purchase. And I'm not sure why different people do that, but a lot of times you'll see list parts listed in a format because somebody did the math and came up and said, oh, you, well, you need 4,700 um, nanofarads for that to work properly in the circuit. But what they didn't do was make it practical um, into something that you could actually order <laughs> and buy a component in that size. So let's do one more example of this really quick here. Okay, let's say you look up online and something says you need a 10,000K resistor, which isn't all that common you would see that, but you're going, wow, 10,000K, right? So um, 1K would be right here, 10K would be here, 100K would be here, 1,000K would be here. So a 10,000K resistor would look something like that. Then you would start saying, well, wow, I can't buy a 10,000K resistor, can't find any of those online. But what you realize is you're really talking about 10 mega. So that's equal to 10 mega ohm resistor. And that you can find online, and that you can buy. Let's try one more here. Um, let's say you found one that said uh, 1,000 microfarad, right? Um, which would be the same as, let's see, um, 1,000 microfarads, right? Or, what does that also equal? It equals to 1, right, millifarad. 1 millifarad. This you may be able to buy, this you may not. Um, just a good example of how you have to learn to move to the left and right of the decimal three, three times to get the values you're looking for. Anytime you're dealing with um, something you see more than a thousand in the, uh, in the, uh, device um, size, then you know you can just move the decimal three places and uh, end up one, two, three here in this case, and you ended up with the point one per se. Um, really simple stuff once you get the hang of it, and uh, we'll kind of take it from there into the next section where we're going to make this much simpler because I'm going to show you how to use some tables, and you won't even have to do this math and moving of the left to right that I've been showing here. Okay. Just in case you're having trouble with some of the math or whatnot, I'm telling you, you really don't have to be able to do it. You just got to be able to understand it. Here's another great one. Let's just say we typed in 680, and let's say it was the measurement we got was in picofarads. Actually, let's make it 6,800 6, picofarads. You read online you were needing to buy something, um, and uh, it said you needed 680, 6,800 picofarad device and you really don't have a 6800 pico and forget about the farad part, part it could be something else too that that's a measurement for capacitance we'll be learning that in the next set of videos but but you could say convert and it'll come back and give you an answer of saying hey this 6800 um, 
picofarads is also equal to 6.8 nanofarads. So you can see right here, um, really simply, which, you know, if you were looking up capacitors to buy, you could go say, oh, I just need some a 6.8 nanofarad if I can't find the 6800 picofarad because they're the exact same thing. And you can see down here below, they have a nice chart that, and a nice printer friendly version of it. You can put this up on your wall and it'll help you convert all these values. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about technician math. You really don't have to understand what's behind it. You just have to kind of get the concepts. And then uh, there's all these charts on the web that will help you figure everything out. There's all kinds of tools out there, just like this little tool right here that helps you convert. You, you really don't have to be a math expert to be a great technician, if that makes sense. Okay, one last super quick thing. You notice we've been writing like 10 to the third or uh, 10 to the minus sixth. Another way you may see this written um, is like this, 10 with a little caret symbol to the third, or um, 10 with a little caret symbol to the minus six. Um, 10 to the fifth goes to 10 with that little caret symbol. Sometimes you'll see it written with the caret and it up top. Sometimes you'll see it written like with the caret right equal, you know, at the same level and uh, on here. And you'll see here on the calculator when we were doing the math earlier, and we said 10, and we hit the um, symbol here for exponent, and then we hit third. Well, if you'll notice up here, it's showing it that way. 10, with the little caret symbol, to the third, we hit the equal sign, and we get 1,000. All right, that's it. Let's move on to the next section, which is even gonna be more exciting. All right, here we go into the, kind of next to the last sessions, two more little sections here. Um, we're going to learn some algebra or refresh ourselves on some algebra. And I got kind of because we're just touching our toe into algebra. So, you know, if you struggle with algebra in uh, maybe uh, junior high, high school, whatnot, uh, don't think that you can't do this math. There's really just two concepts that we've got to learn here, really three. Um, one, two, and three. So the first one is a variable. And if you'll remember in math, um, with algebra, we always had some type of variable. And the first thing, let's just write, uh, I'll write out an equation, 2 plus x equals 4. Um, the second thing you have in algebra is a constant. So in this equation, you have two constants right here, 2 and 4. And they're constants because you know what they are. Um, in this equation, you have one variable. Okay, so the one variable here is x, and x is what we're trying to solve for in this equation. Um, and then the other concept you need to know in, for algebra for what we're doing is that everything on the left-hand side of the equal sign equals the stuff on the right-hand side. So this equals this. Um, so let's try to figure that out. 2 plus what equals 4? Well, that's not too hard to figure out. You can say 2 plus 2 in your head equals 4, right? Um, if you can get that concept down, you pretty much got it whooped at this point. I'm going to do just a little bit more algebra. The good news is um, you don't even really have to master this because much like those charts and whatnot earlier, I'm going to show you some simple ways to work around this. So, But let's just do a, a couple more, right? 6 times, uh, let's just say y equals 24. If you, if you remember back in real algebra, the way this worked was you're trying to get rid of this 6 times here. Um, and you're trying to move it to the other side of the equation so you only have your variable on one side of the equal sign. So how do you get rid of 6 times? Well, you do a divide by 6, right? And the same thing over here, 24 um, divided by 6 equals what? If you come back over here, 6 times 6 times 4 equals 24. Um, so really, the way you do this is you kind of we cancel these things out by moving it to the other side of the equation. Let's do another one. 2 plus x equals 5. Well, because this is 2 plus, we're going to get rid of it by saying 2 minus, right? So 2 minus on this side, these will cancel out 
equals to 5 minus 2 on this side. So then x is equal, x here is equal to 5 minus 2, which is equal to 3. And if you'll remember then, 2 plus 2 plus 3 equals 2, 5. So we solved for the variable x here by moving everything else here to the other side of the equation over here, leaving just x on this side, and then doing the math over here to get to that. If I've lost you in this section right here, um, don't worry about it. I'm going to show you it. it gets even simpler. And if you were able to follow this along, at least you get the concepts of moving things um, from one side of the equal sign on an equation over here um, that's not part of the variable. So y plus some variable. Um, e you know, so it's 6. y plus 6 equals 12, right? We're going to say y minus 6 equals 12 minus 6 over here. So all we really did was get rid of all this by moving it to the other side of the equation, right? 12 minus 6 equals 2, what? 6. So y is equal to 6. Um, and that's what we did. All right, that's enough of the crazy algebraic math. Uh, that uh, That's as far as you'd ever need to go, and uh, probably not quite that far because I'm going to show you how to make it even simpler. All right, I'm going to teach you something here. This is an equation that has three variables in it that we use all the time in electronics, like 90% of the time. Um, and if you'll remember, you cannot solve an equation, uh, going back to some algebraic principles, uh, this is a three variable equation. You have to know two of the three to solve for it. So um, in this case, let's just say V equals, you got to know the two of the numbers. So if it's two and three here, just for whatever reason, um, you know, I and R together, there's an implied little multiply sign. So in this case, V is equal to six, right? Well, there are multiple iterations of this equation. And the beauty of it is, I'm going to give them to you. So r equals 2 v over i. Well, how did we get to that? If you remember earlier, we talked, we came over here. Um, remember we talked about how if you move something to the other side of the equation, you could solve for it? Well, we want to get r by itself, right? So what do I do? If I'm going to do that, I'm going to divide this side by i, right? Because this was 6 times. And the reason how you get rid of 6 times is you do 6, I mean, not 6 i times you do i divided by and if you do the other side divide by well look what we just did we canceled this out and if you'll notice here we have r r equals to v over i we just solved for it right let's do that one more time here v equals i r and let's write one more part down here which is going to be i equals v over R. Don't worry about what these stand for, just know they're variables. Um, and in this case, what we're going to get to, um, how they did this, they're trying to solve for I this time. Well, how do you get rid of a, an R over here, right? Um, what did you do? You divide by R on this side, you divide by R on this side. These cancel out, leaving you with I equals V over R. So, um, what you kind of got is the three dimensions of this equation, right? V equals I times R, right? R equals V over I, right? And we said I equals to V over R. So by giving you this, I've already done all the algebra for you. And you can write these down. We're going to show you some charts here shortly in the next session. Um, but this, these three equations right here, which if you'll notice are just simple multiplications. It's I times R. It's V divided by I here. And then V divided by R here. Right? Okay, let's make this thing real world here. If you'll remember um, we gave you the equations up here earlier, and, um, and because you can write those down or have them stuck on a post-it note at your monitor or whatever, you really don't even have to memorize them, although 
you will use these enough in electronics too. They'll be worthy of memorizing some. But let's play out a couple scenarios here. Let's play out something where we know R and we know I, um, but we don't know V. And so what are we trying to solve for? V equals two. Oh yeah, let's go back to our equation. What? I times R. I is what? Six here times R here, which is two, right? Equals two, 12. So in our case, V is equal to 12. Simple stuff. Um, this one here, V is 12, I is 3. Hmm, what do we not know? We don't know the R because we've got two constants here, right? So if we come over here on this, R is equal to V over I. So R equals V over I. Well, what is V? V is here, let's see, 12 divided by 3, right? Forget about this. Equals to 12 divided by 3. You can do that with a calculator. 4. Right? R is equal to 4 in this case. Similar scenario down here. This time we know V, we know R, but we do not know what? What's missing? We don't know I. Right? So in this case, we got to do a little bit of math. I is equal to V over R, right? Which is the same as I is equal to, in this case, V 120 divided by R here, which is 10, which, by the way, I is equal to 10, right? I have just taught you 90% of the math you will ever do in electronics. And in the next section, you're going to learn exactly how we apply this. I'll give you a little bit of hint here in this one. Um, if we pretend that V was voltage and I was current and R was resistance, which we've got some some learning to do to, to know what those all mean. Um, but we were able to just calculate some very important stuff right here. You, you may not have realized it or not, um, but we we did 90% of the math you would have needed to have done um, to calculate. If you remember in the very beginning, I showed you that Western Electric Amplifier and all those components and values in there. Well, I've taught you all the math you need to know right now to be able to walk through that thing and figure out how they came up with values and whatnot. Now there's more than math you need to know. I mean there will be principles we'll have to learn on how you apply this math, but this is as tough as the math gets um, as it relates to electronics. Um, I've got one more quick section I want to show you, one more set of uh, variable equations per se. If you can get it down, we'll go from 90% to about 98% of what you'll ever need to know. All right, here we go. This is the last equation I'm going to show you. It's another one of those. You're just this is one. I'm not going to show you the kind of the math or science behind how we derived all this. Um, I'll explain it to you in later sections as how they all relate. But let's just say you trust this equation. P is equal to V times I. Um, and P is equal to I squared times R, and P is equal to V squared over R. We actually got to these to these numbers here um, by substituting in other equations that we just learned on the previous page. But it's a little too advanced for what you need to know. You just need to trust. It's kind of like the timetable for the tides we talked about for right now, just trust. Uh, really, we're learning math, um, not theory at this point. So, um, scenario one, V is equal to 2 and I is equal to 3. Well, if P is equal to V times I and V is equal to 2 and I is equal to 3, right? What? P is equal to 6. We just solved one. Scenario two, P is equal to I to the second power of R, right? This is where you'll come along and say P is equal to 2 to the second power, right, times R. Well, go get your calculator out and do what we did earlier and just plug that in. But I can tell you 2 to the second power is what? 2 times 2 times R, right? And 2 times 2 is 4, right? And in this case, R is 3 equals to 12. P is equal to 12 in this case, right? And in this last scenario, um, P is equal to V squared. Ooh, that's a little scary. 
So that would be 3 squared, right, divided by, it says here r, r in this case is 3, right, so what 3 times 3, right, or 3 squared, you could use the little uh, calculator if you need to, brings you up with 9 divided by 3, right, equals to 3. So p is equal to 3. If you can follow along and do this math and solve for these simple little numbers based on having any two of the three pieces of this equation, um, you can now do 98% of all the math you will ever need to do to in electronics to be a great technician, to even design an amplifier, um, lots of other things. Um, so. Let's hang with that, and uh, if, you, if you've hung to this point, um, great. If you haven't, shoot me questions out there, or there are lots of other YouTube videos out there on some of this math. I'm just trying to make it a little bit practical. Uh, the last thing I want to do here in this session is show you an example or two of some of how some of this stuff plays out. Okay, in the last section of this video, I'm going to try to make it real for you. Um, and show you how the math we just did is very practical and something we would use all the time. So this is a schematic here for a Pilot 232 um, console pull um, amplifier. Um, it runs uh, EL84 output tubes, otherwise known as 6BQ5s. Great little amp. Um, they're amazing sounding and uh, lots of people have sought these things out over the years. At any rate, what I want to show you here was that um, it, you don't have to understand the electronics at this point. You don't have to understand even what a schematic is. Um, you don't have to understand what volts current um, resistance is at this point. I just want to show you that the math uh, we just used is very relevant. So one of the things you do with a tube amplifier is you want to bias the output tubes here. In other words, set the operating parameters around these tubes. Um, and determine how hot they might run or how cool they may run, um, things of that nature. So if you'll notice that the cathodes here, um, there and here, are tied together with this little line. They come together from here and here, and they come down and they go through this resistor here. And if you'll notice, it's a 120 ohm resistor. You don't even have to know what an ohm is at this point. Just know we're dealing with 120 and it goes to ground. And since this is a resistor, we'll just call this our R. Um, the other thing I would note is that you've got two tubes um, flowing through this one resistor. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, if you'll notice when we jump over to the amplifier, I've actually changed mine to 150 ohm from the 120 ohm. The reason I've done that is these amps um, historically run fairly hot. Um, the tubes get really hot, the amp runs really hot. Sounds great, puts out you know, as much power as it can that way. Um, the challenge is, you know, the tubes don't last as long or whatnot. So I've actually changed this to 150 ohm in my amplifier um, as part of biasing, and I did the math on that. And it was in, it was in an effort to uh, cool this thing down a little bit. So. Let's go over and kick it old school, get back to some video like we normally do here, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Alright, welcome back to some old school video. Check it out. iPod's playing. This thing's a uh, little amplifier here, sounding great. Uh, just so you know, I'm working with something that functional works and not some theoretical setup I made here. But you can see here, this is a pilot manufactured by Pilot Radio Model 232 amplifier here. This is one I've um, been working on a little bit. But um, if you get back here to the output transistors like we talked about earlier, and um, if, you'll, if you can see it here on top of this resistor right here, it'll tell you that it is 150 ohm. See the number 150 ohm on it. And I will tell you that measuring uh, current through that resistor is very difficult. You actually have to cut the lead to the resistor, insert, a, insert an ammeter into it, and then measure the current. It's One, it's dangerous because then you're pulling uh, high voltages outside of this amplifier over, you know, into your meter or whatnot. Um, two, you've cut a wire, you've got a solder back now. 
So hey, if we want to know the current flowing through these tubes, there's other ways to figure that out. Remember the three-legged equation we talked about earlier? I equals V over R and whatnot. Um, so in this case, um, we're going to try to solve for I. In this case, we know R. It's right here. It's 150 ohms. But what we don't know is V. Well, guess what we're going to do? We have connected across this resistor, um, which happens to be R in this case. <coughs> just a set of probes and we've came over here on just a plain old multimeter and we've gone to volts DC right and what do we have here 12.22 volts right so uh, let's let's take a look at one more thing before we go back to the uh, classroom over there um, this is the RCA manual um, that uh, it's a receiving tube manual that I've shown you many times before um, and in it lists the EL84 6BQ5. Um, but if you kind of read down through this thing um, and all the specs about it, whatnot, at some point you're going to get into maximum ratings here, right? And you're going to read cathode current, and the maximum you're ever going to want to run this thing at is 65 milliamps, right? So uh, let's jump back over there to the other video and uh, we'll, we'll see what's going on. Okay, let's just apply what we just learned over there um, here in this video. So, we know that uh, we knew two things, right? What did we measure when we went and measured? We measured voltage was equal to what? 12.22 volts. And we measured also that resistance was equal to 150 ohms. Well, I'll tell you what, for this stuff, let's not even worry about what those are, right? We're just learning the math at this point. So if we know two of these, we know we know V and we know R, which one of these three equations would we use? Well, guess what? It's this one, because we know V and we know R, and we're trying to solve for I. So I, in this case, would equal to 12.22 divided by 150. And if we bring up our handy-dandy calculator over here, 12.22 divided by... 150, we're going to get this 0.8146666, whatever. Um, if it, let me show you something here real quick. If you'll notice, that means that equals to, what, what do we have here? Um, 0.0814 was what the calculator gave us. Um, well, if you'll notice, that's measured in, let's just call it amps. Um, but if we move the number 1, 2, 3, remember, 10 to the minus 3, then we could also call this 81.4 milli. And in this case, it happens to be measured in amps. Um, but since we're not worried about that, that we could straight that out, 81.4 milli. Um, so, and then if you'll remember, there were two tubes flowing through that one resistor, so the current from both of them. So ultimately we end up having to divide that in half to get the current through each tube at that point. And what we come up here is 40.7 milliamps through each of those tubes. And if you'll remember back in the specs that we looked at, um, 65 um, milliamps was the um, the maximum that they wanted to see. Um, so let's let's do one more thing here real quick. If you'll remember, I had originally showed you on the schematic that this thing um, had a 120 ohm resistor in it instead of the 150 ohm resistor here that I ended up putting in this thing. So if you did the math on that real quick, um, and I won't pull the calculator up, but it comes out to basically be 101.8 eight um, milliamps at that point in time, right? Eight three actually. And if you divide that by two, right, you end up with 50.92 milliamps. Um, so if you'll notice the original resistor that was in this thing had this tube pulling much more current than after I increased the resistance and dropped in the 150 ohm, it lowered the amount of current flowing through that tube, ultimately cooling it down. Now, at the same time it cooled it down, it also lowered 
the output power that this thing produces so uh, not quite as uh, strong or um, level of amplification amplification going on in this thing but uh, you can real quickly learn that we use this math right here in a very complex thing that I would say 90% of people that own a tube amplifier wouldn't have no idea about or what these numbers really meant or how to calculate them or how to tell if you had too much current flowing through your tubes or not enough etc etc so I hope you've learned something here today I hope that uh, you know this math doesn't seem overwhelming and uh, it's one of those things you practice it you use it a little bit and uh, the more and more you go on the easier it gets but um, Hopefully we may brought you a real world example here. Let me show you one more real quick real world example. All right, here's a very practical example and this is about the best my drawing gets. Remember you guys hired an engineer to teach you uh, electronics. You did not hire an artist. So, um, But this is supposed to be a light bulb and if you'll notice up here at the top it's labeled 60 watts. So a 60 watt light bulb and it's glowing bright and working well. So um, if you'll remember earlier, we, we, had a, we had a few equations, right? One was equal to P is equal to I times V. Well, let's assume in this case, this 60 watt light bulb is what the P is talking about. So uh, 60 watts is a measure of power. So in this case, we know the power. Um, let's see, volts. Oh, we know that. So what's your, what's your house? Uh, line that feeds your uh, electricity, right? Here in the US it is 120 volts, right? Times I, right? But we don't know what I is and that's what we're trying to solve for. And remember earlier in algebra we said, hey, if we're trying to solve for something we want to get this other stuff on the other side of the equation, right? So in this case what we're going to do is here we have 120 times, so what are we going to want to do? We're going to want to divide this side by 120, right? And we're going to do the same over here on the other side, 120. And these will cancel out. And then I is equal to 60 divided by 120. So I is going to equal to 0.5. And in this case, it is current. So that is going to be measured in amps. Another way to write this, if you use the uh, learn from the uh, moving to the three, three to the left, this would be now also known as 500 milliamps. So we just figured out how much current flows through your light bulb in your house if you have a 60 watt light bulb. Um, hey, if you increase this light bulb to 120 watts, then it would be, I mean 120 um, watt power, then it would be 120 divided by 120 equals one or one amp. Uh, so a 120 watt bulb will use twice as much current, pull twice as much current, so a full amp instead of a half of an amp here. Guys and gals, I hope that uh, if you've learned something today, um, I will tell you that I've updated the syllabus uh, significantly, and I'll show that to you at the beginning of the next video. I've added some stuff, I've rearranged and sorted in different orders that made more logical sense. Uh, but what I will tell you is coming up next are some basic electronic principles. We're going to learn what volts are. Um, we're going to learn what resistance is. In other words, what are, what are ohms. Um, we're going to learn what current is and, uh, and how you represent it all in the next episode. So uh, stay tuned and I uh, hope you enjoyed this new format. I'm learning. Uh, you know, it'll get better, I promise. But uh, give me some feedback out here and let me know how things are going. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, keep watching.